Take it All right. Away. Thanks for coming, everybody. My name is Becky Worley. I am not used to talking to an audience like this. I work for Good Morning America, and I talk to your end consumers. So someday you're going to be pitching me on non-meat-based meat products to uh, bring to the, uh, the broad market, I hope sooner rather than later. But excited to be here today with you. Um, I really encourage you to use that Slido app and ask your questions. Uh, this particular group and this topic is pretty wonkish. We're really talking about the entire chain, the supply chain from engineering plants to the supply chain management, transportation processing, transportation again, and then taste profile. So let me get right to our guests. Uh, I'm going to introduce them quickly um, and then let them talk a little bit about what the past is, what the legacy systems are that the agriculture business works with historically and in the present. And then we're going to spend a lot of this panel talking about the future. How do we optimize this entire chain for plant-based meat, plant proteins, as opposed to just working on sort of the vestigial appendages of legacy agriculture systems. So um, let's start uh, by talking. Uh, I'm going to introduce our three panelists. Natalie DeNicola is from Benson Hill Biosystems. Um, succinctly, you're all about genomics, research, plant engineering. So that's really where she's coming on the the field side of the plants and how to optimize them. Then Mark Matlock is Senior Vice President Food Research at ADM, processing, sourcing, transport, all of those supply chain issues. And then Rajesh Patanini is Mr. Taste. He's working on mouthfeel, on taste profile, and he's the guy who is ultimately responsible for converting the consumer. How do we convert the consumer to, as was discussed in the last panel, love plant-based meat, not just to eat it because they should, but because they want to? So I'm going to ask each of you to just give us a couple minutes on what the past and sort of the present of your business is. It's, you, know, you, have, you guys particularly have legacy businesses in some way, um, and how do, we're going to work on how do we move that forward. So Natalie, why don't you start? Past and present for Benson Hill and what you do. OK, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank the GFI folks for the chance to be here today. It's really a great energy in this conference. Um, I am an environmental toxicologist by training who worked for over 25 years in agribusiness. The last few as a consultant um, with organizations from grower organizations and multinational ag input companies to CPGs and spending a fair bit of time working with the um, early stage companies, the startups, and really trying to help folks think through the evolution, as Bruce mentioned in the opening um, session, the evolution that's happening in our food system. I am here representing Benson Hill Biosystems, which is one of my clients that I'm really excited about because we bring um, innovation both tech from a technology perspective but, both, both, but also a business model perspective that I think is really important. Um, Dr. Lameau mentioned the natural genetic diversity um, on a previous panel and that's something we feel really passionate about that I think is one of the differences of what's happening in the food system today. Um, we have estimates of 30,000 edible plant species out there our food system uses, focuses on about 30. The genomic innovation has been mostly focused from the private sector on about three. Um, and in addition to all these different crops that haven't received that much uh, innovation in that space, there's also the, the genome of a plant is actually more diverse and complex than that of a human. So even within a crop species, there's this enormous amount of genetic diversity, and yet we really haven't been tapping this very powerful resource as um, a way to differentiate products and really help improve our food system. So why? Well, part of it is that that kind of innovation uh, typically took a lot of time, um, a certain level of expertise, and a lot of money. And there were really very few companies that were making that kind of an R&D investment at a really big scale. They tended to be a couple large uh, multinational agribusinesses 
who were focusing on the largest acre crops and very focused on the benefits that would bring their direct customer, which was the farmer. And that's how it was for, for many years. What Benson Hill is trying to bring um, is a really different perspective around that. So while we're working in genomics, which is a legacy area or research, if you will, to some extent, it's very, there's been huge benefits that have come through genomic innovation. We're actually an early stage company, just a few years old. Um, and what we're bringing is, we're, we're taking the advances that the last panel talked about around um, sequencing data, advances in sequencing data, phenotype data, environmental monitoring, um, that is, that is providing essentially a data explosion that when you combine that with machine learning, when you combine that with a real understanding of plant biology, it really um, provides enormous opportunity to do predictive genomics, predictive breeding. That coupled with a lot of the new kind of innovations that are coming, such as gene editing that was mentioned earlier, which I, we'll probably talk a little bit more about. So we have essentially built a genomics platform for lots of different kinds of crops using that kind of data and a suite of genomic tools like breeding, gene editing, and even GMOs um, to really tap into this genetic diversity and improve crops. The other piece of it, though, is whereas the traditional companies that worked in genomics owned the germplasm, they decided what crops, they owned the germplasm of the crops, that data, and they decided what kind of traits and benefits they wanted to bring. We've built it as a community platform. So our mission is really to empower innovators across the entire value chain, from the traditional kind of seed companies, all the way to CPGs and retailers, really, ingredient companies and others in between, all across the chain, the ability to be utilizing advanced genomics and this um, enormous natural genetic diversity to improve our food system. And that's really a very different business model than where we've been before. 30,000 edible plants, 30 that agribusiness has focused on, and three that genetic editing has been applied to. Well, at least genomic innovation, different kinds of advanced breeding and GMOs and things like that. Super interesting. Mark Matlock is at ADM, as I mentioned. Um, tell us a little bit about past and, and present. You have a, a long history in, in this process. Thank you. Uh, I'm also very pleased to be here today, and ADM may not be a company that uh, many consumers are aware of, but we're very integral to the food supply uh, globally for the, uh, the world. Uh, I've got a slide up, and it shows the trade routes and the origination and the destination points that we handle. Every day we're processing 100,000 metric tons of oil seeds a day to produce the vegetable oils, the protein meals, and that sort of thing. But also, we have a legacy in plant proteins. Much like Morningstar Foods, who spoke earlier today, uh, we started processing soybeans back in the 1930s, uh, when it first became a crop in the US. Uh, in the 1960s, we invented texturized vegetable protein. TVP is a registered trademark to ADM. Uh, in the 1980s, we developed some of the first generation uh, veggie burger technologies. Uh, one of the things that's a memory for me is in 1989 going to the Moscow in the Soviet Union and serving up veggie burgers uh, to Mikhail Gorbachev as he came through the, uh, through the uh, trade show. But ADM has been a, a pioneer in, in vegetable-based foods, and, and the reason was we saw that as a need to be able to supply the protein needs of the future. And so that continues to be a focus. Uh, this year, we completed uh, a $250 million uh, soy protein complex in Brazil to expand the, to meet the needs for, for proteins in that uh, uh, part of the world. Uh, the other thing is we're expanding beyond just soy. So uh, whether you want almonds, macadamia nuts, uh, uh, edible beans, pinto beans, black beans, uh, we source all of those products, and we're just completing the construction of a legume processing plant in North Dakota that's going to be producing the best tasting pea protein, uh, we believe, uh, to, that the world has seen. And we're continuing to build out all these alternative plant proteins. And then finally, uh, one of the key things is, you know, we talked earlier, some of the speakers, about it's not just 
nutrition, but it's also taste, texture, and functionality. And to put the functionality that you need into these proteins so that they work in the various applications is a key part of what we do. And along with companies like uh, Rajesh works for dealing with the taste, which if it doesn't taste good, the consumer will not be a repeat buyer. So that's part of what we do at ADM. Rajesh, taste is so important, and it really spoke to me when you said your job is to convert the consumer. So what's the history of <coughs> creating optimal taste profile for plant-based meat? Um, uh, two aspects. I think I'll first talk about the question of yours, and then I'll explain how Kerry fits into this. Uh, the way uh, traditionally the ingredient companies have gotten into this space is scale. So when scale becomes important, yield, and the factors of optimizing the process becomes more important. Mm -hmm. So because of that, the focus when you are coming up with protein isolates or protein concentrates is more focused as an engineering function. Mm -hmm. um, my undergrad background is engineering. So I could empathize how important the unit operations aspect is. But in the process, what gets compromised is the taste. Uh, why is that the case? Um, that's because of, again, um, the, the way the business operates is on volumes and how to get to a lot of people because as the population is growing, we need to serve more, more of the people out there. To take a step back, how do we approach differently uh, for the same question, right? So I, then I put myself to empathize the situation of yourself in a product developer show. Let's assume uh, somebody tells a product developer, hey, we are, we are going to have uh, this, this great uh, formulation that we want to make, you pick your pea protein, for example. The next thing you know, if, especially if you're a CPG company, every, every ingredient pea company wants to give their product so you can try it. That's next, that, they, they don't taste the same if you look at it. And, but this person has to pick the best out of the lot while keeping the cost constraint as well as the marketing attributes that are looked for. So that's where the need for connectivity into sensory and analytical sciences become important. Most times what happens is a formulation is made and then you submit to the sensory and analytical teams. Actually, I think by doing that, you actually have already compounded the problem and now you're trying to figure out what the taste problem is. I think bringing them early into this whole gamut of understanding, and when I say sensory, people literally take it as it's a different test of, let's take two samples and say which one works out. Oh, this works well, let's give it to the, let's send it to the consumer test. I'm not talking about just traditional sensory. It's about understanding. Let's take a, a burger that is getting made, right? Are you going to put it in retail or are you going to put it in food service? This matters a lot when it comes because if you're putting in food service, you know it, you have control. A culinary person is going to take it out, add up the spices, and there's a whole control of it till the consumer is tasting. But if you give it to retail, now you're expecting the consumer to use it like they use in their natural behavior. That's a challenge, that's a, that's a tipping point at which the consumer needs to feel, I can play with this. Mm -hmm. But how many of us are really spending the time to, to take that next step? Uh, one of the panelists before mentioned behaviors. We need to change behaviors, right? But it's not changing behaviors by marketing, but changing behaviors by empathizing with the pain point that a consumer is going to face when they reach home. And I can tell myself, I have two small kids at home, I'm with 5.30 to 8 is like a nightmare at home, right? I'm sure most of you, you get in and you want to make fast the dish because otherwise these guys will scream and then it's a whole hell match out there. And again, you, my and my wife are looking at each other, what did we do, right? So, so in those scenarios, do you have time to really play with it and feel artistic and all that? So that part needs to be included in that discussion. And that's where taste really stands out. Um. I, I love, I just want you to go say one quick thing as we think about this entire process, because the goal of this panel in particular is to rethink how do we engineer from the beginning to that witching hour when you're trying to feed your kids, all the way through that for a plant-based meat. And I want you to talk, just walk us through what you said about empathizing with the burger itself. What happens, process? And then, you know, it's processed, it's reconstituted, it's dried, it's processed again. Talk, just give me 60 seconds on that journey that a, a, a protein I, I, I call take. it like a C CSI moment, right? It's like they got the body and now they're figuring out how he died or she died. <laughs> so the same thing, you got the pea protein sitting in front of you. 
and there are four P proteins, or let's say how many there are. The next thing, the question is, what did the, like let's say I bought it from ADM, right? What did they do? That's their IP, they're not going to tell me. But at the same time, I need to solve the problem. There are th three stages of problem there. One, lost in translation. Everybody says card body. Uh, is your card body same as my card body? Are we talking the same language? And the, when the consumer says, I like it, where did we lose them? They only talk in emotional terms. They are not talking in descriptive terms. So that, that bridge needs to be bridged. That's where most, actually, flavor companies tend to have lexicons that will help this bridge. But I still feel they are at a stage that needs to be leveraged further. These words need to get out there. This language needs to be in the consumer. So that's why Kerry actually is spending time in creating where it is not just for internal experts, but work with our customers so that we call it taste talk. It's a talk. Let's talk about this 30 words. Can somebody tell, somebody says animalic? Oh, animalic, what is that? We can, hey, smell this. Are we talking the same thing? Or no, you're talking a different thing. So that we are talking the same problem. That's one for identifying the problem. And then the, the next part of it is really understanding. If these pea proteins are made, what is it going through? So obviously, pea by itself, when you eat it, it's so beautiful. The next thing you know, you take it, you crush it. And then you put it in some acid to precipitate it out. Then you take it, and then you may centrifuge it, or you may do some fermentation, because you want it to be a bit more easier to mix it, based on the texture and functionality. So in that scenario, the off notes that are forming in each stage are very different. You need to, that's where I say, when somebody asks me, do you guys sell a protein masker? I said, like, I think from a marketing standpoint, yes. But it is best that we spend time with you, know your product, know your pea protein that you are taking. The, we got so good now, just taking, if somebody gives us a pea protein of this, we could guess what compounds are the problem. And so then, literally, is serving the right masker or asking them to go back. If you are able to process it, especially, then, hey, do you guys, can you think of this step? Looks like you're putting too much heat, so you're forming these, these pyrazines. Or, hey, you're doing fermentation. Looks like you don't need to tell me what the organism is. But I see there is an indole. Indole at, at very low levels. I think I have given this in one of my one, uh, previous meetings. Is, it's such a compound. Like when I talk to my flavorist, uh, Larry uh, at Kerry, He's like, Rajesh, at very low levels, it's beautiful. It's in honey. But the same thing at slightly higher levels becomes fecal. Mm -hmm. So now, just the same ingredient, and this is because of protein degradation. So in those scenarios, knowing it, you can actually solve the problem. And that, that, and that means there is more science needed to really get there. That nails the whole point of this discussion, which is in order to get the taste profile right, streamlining the whole process with as little process thing mm -hmm. is going to help you in the end. Yep. So let's start again at Natalie's end and talk a little bit about the future and that goal of streamlining the process. So you know, when you look at agricultural products, they've been optimized really for historical uses, yield, drought, route to market. How do you see genetic editing, modification, as a way to streamline this straight out of the field? Yep. Well, um, we need to keep focusing on farmer benefits, um, but it doesn't need to be a trade-off with consumer benefits. And so we need to start focusing a lot more on consumer benefits and tapping into this diversity that we just discussed. So we've built out a lot of the, the data platform, the tools to be able to do that, what we need now is to work with you on your pain points. What are those things that you need help on? Is it that you want to get rid of some off flavor? There's a chance, there's a good, good possibility that that diversity exists within that plant species and we are able to find the gene and we can knock out that gene or we can underexpress the, the off flavor gene. Same with um, things like umami that might enhance flavor. If you have anti-nutrients that are causing allergen allergenicity issues, there's a potential to be able to knock something like that out with gene editing. If you are looking to um, improve the plant architecture for processing, that's another thing that we can, we can look at. And then there's the amino acid profiles as an example. If you have, you know, plants, most plant species do uh, produce all the amino acids, not necessarily within the uh, levels that we need as humans. 
it's a pretty in energy intensive process for a plant. They're going to grow, they're going to, you know, develop the profile that they need. We can, through um, understanding genetics and genomics and these tools that exist today, we can actually express the, the amino acids at the levels that we as humans need. So these are things that we can, if you want, design crops to have that endpoint use in mind and those pain points that you're trying to address um, so that those ingredients are feeding into these systems that are being optimized in other ways as well. Alex in the audience asks a question that I think is really salient. He says, which plant proteins are not currently used but are expected to be novel sources of plant protein for plant-based meat and other production? I have to be honest, I can't answer what specific proteins. <laughs> I could talk about a lot of the different crops that we've looked at, many different crops that were, that were um, in discussions with different folks around improving that uh, range from some of the row crops to pulses and legumes um, all over the place, but I can't speak to the exact proteins myself. Mark, why don't you and Rajesh just na nail off some products, some plants that you also know of that you're interested in? Sure. So, um, you know, one of the things I would say just in general, the class of legumes is where we draw a lot of our um, uh, you know, they are the best at producing protein on a given acre of land. So these would be things like black beans, uh, navy beans, red beans, things of that nature, and we actually have a seed business that, that produces those products. Uh, but also things that you may not have heard of. Uh, uh, we also are very big in, in nuts and, and uh, things like that, but peanut proteins, wheat protein isolates. Uh, but uh, there's crops like uh, lupin, which is a crop no one's heard of in this country, but yet it is, has as much protein in its raw form as a soybean does, but it doesn't have the same level of oil content. So you don't necessarily need a solvent to pull the oil out. So things like that may be, but I think it's out of the class of legumes if you want to really have something that fixes nitrogen from the air and doesn't require external nitrogen source fertilizers. Josh, any products that? I, I, I think lentils in general are not mm -hmm. are not leveraged to the level they should be. I mean, this is not a new concept. I mean, coming from India, I lived on lentils. I don't think I ate much meat then, right? Um, now, now I'm a carnivore compared to a vegetarian, reverse. Uh, but when you look like that, the lentils have a lot of functionality. I mean, I have one example I could just think of is the same lentil I would have as a breakfast. The same lentil was my sauce. And the same lentil was also used as, a, as like, a, like you can eat it like a steam, a fry, and, and also as your chutney. All three from the same lentil. I mean, those kind of areas, I mean, if there are people from South Asia, they, 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 can, they know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So this, there is opportunity for it. We don't need to go after a novel, trendy out there. I think we should be able to use what we got. And because culture and the history has taught us a lot, and it's a matter of using it as a technology. And, and if I can just, I'm sorry, I kind of misunderstood the question. So I agree completely. These are two classes or two areas that there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I thought you kind of meant like what specific products we were talking about, which I couldn't share. But, but yeah, I totally concur. Those are two, two really uh, very rich areas for us to be developing products in. Yeah. Uh, Natalie, talk to us a little bit as we close out on your side of, the, of this about the genetic editing and modification that you're doing, how you see that as being beneficial and then maybe we can ask the question of how you know consumers have strong feelings. And a lot of the vegan vegetarian consumers have strong feelings about genetically modified food. How do we deal with that on a marketing side? So talk about the upside and overcoming the downside, if you would. Sure, OK. Um, well, I think from an upside perspective, um, gene editing in particular allows us to, um, it's really, in, in a lot of ways, sort of an extension of more traditional kind of Mendelian plant breeding. But we can make changes much faster with a lot more precision and a lot more affordably. And part of what that means is you don't have to be just the largest companies working on the largest acres in order to be able to um, really leverage genomics much more. And so that allows us to be working in a lot of different crops, focusing on a lot of these different kinds of consumer benefits, um, removing allergens from foods, a lot of things that we haven't really seen as much focus on in the genomic space. Now, from a public acceptance perspective, which is something that we take really uh, very seriously, 
in all transparency, I worked at Monsanto. I led sustainability there for a long time. And I had, I think, a privilege there, although it was sometimes pretty intense, of really hearing what consumers wanted in their food system that they did not feel the traditional agriculture system was delivering for them. And if you took enough time to talk to folks about technology and food, now gene editing isn't the same as a GMO, um, in that the way we're talking about it here today, it's about using diversity that already exists within the plant species, so it's not crossing DNA from a different plant species. Yet, we understand there's, there's questions and concerns and what. So my learnings from that experience is when I could talk to consumers for enough time um, about technology and food in general, I can oftentimes get them much more comfortable around the amount of testing that's done and the safety and things like that. Some folks had philosophical concerns with that and I very much respect that. But a lot of times you were able to get to the place where they understand or they appreciated that they had innovation in lots of parts of, and technology in lots of parts of their lives and that this is another part that we, we, we can leverage to try to address some of our big global challenges. They had two concerns fun fundamentally. One was, are you using this technology really to make improvements that align with my values and bringing me benefit? Some of that is around more focus on health, more focus on sustainability. It's also um, real confidence that there's appropriate regulatory oversight, confidence around transparency, and that they can know what's in their food. So there's this whole piece around the values that they care about and wanting to know that you share those values and respect their values, and that you're trying to use your innovations to catalyze that kind of improvement. The other big area, I would say, was around diversity. Some of it was around wanting more diversity in different kinds of crops, like we've talked about, and different kinds of benefits, but also more diversity in who's actually controlling the food supply. I mean, there was a lot of concern that there's too few companies that have just too much influence, and they wanted to see more choice and more diversity and different kinds of innovators. And so as we um, enter in this space, we're trying to be very transparent. We believe that appropriate regulatory oversight is important. Um, we believe industry commitment to best practices around transparency and use is important. There's something called the Center for Food Integrity, which has started a, a, a steering team, if you will, across the entire value chain Plus it has conservation organizations, consumer watchdog organizations, academics as part of that, that's really trying to understand um, what are the best practices and approaches we should be taking around gene editing and food. And we represent, we're one of the two companies representing sort of new food innovators on that. And if any would, anybody would like to share thoughts with me, I'd really value that very much. Um, so that's what we're really trying to do, is be very respectful of those values. We're trying to partner with others around the, across the entire value chain to help utilize this technology to catalyze some of the kinds of changes that we, we believe consumers are looking for. All right. Mark, I want to move on to you and talk. This mirrors a question that we received from the audience as well. But, um, you know, a lot of the soy protein is a byproduct from the legacy uh, soybean oil production, mm -hmm. and so it's sort of a vestigial appendage, and it wasn't really from the ground up engineered. Do you think there's enough scale for a plant-based meat market to really go for it in the entire process of products that were originally, you know, that are really designed for this end product and not byproduct? Yes, in fact, uh, all of our soy proteins are actually made in, in uh, you know, a separate facility from the ones that, that uh, you know, you start with a different starting material. When you're um, uh, desolventizing a soybean, uh, if you, you have to do it at a very low temperature in order to have the protein still extractable. So that's kind of the, the first phase of it. But we also know that we have some consumers who want to avoid the use of solvents. And so we also have technology where we do this with extruders. So basically we can expel the oil, uh, we dehaul those soybeans in a very special way that we don't damage the oil bodies, that gives us additional uh, flavor stability. And so designing the process very specific for the quality of the protein you want in the end. And with that particular technology, it's kind of interesting, it's a downward scale. So we can produce organic 
organic soy products, or we could produce, take a single variety of a soybean. So for example, there's one that has a soy or a protein content over 50%. That's significantly higher than a standard soybean. You can grow that crop specifically, contract grow it in an organic way if you want, and then when you dehull it and you remove the oil, you're up at the level of, say, a concentrate. So then that allows it to go into uh, foods in a very different way. Mm -hmm. to get you to that point. Um, talk to us, I'm curious, an inside baseball conversation you might be having um, with your engineers and scientists about something in the processing that's going to lead to um, better mouthfeel, less double processing, like you mm -hmm. talked about, Rajesh, better taste profile. Sure. What's something that you're looking at inside the company that gets you excited? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've done a lot of work on is the use of enzymes to provide some of that functionality. So uh, a standard soy protein or, or any of the plant proteins tend to be very high molecular weight. And depending upon what application you're going into, you may, you may need to reduce that molecular weight to reduce the viscosity so you can get more grams of protein. And, and you see this more in beverages than you do meat. But uh, in meat, you want something that has emulsifying capability. You want gel strength, so you do want the high molecular weight. But in beverages, you want a lower molecular weight that gives you a better viscosity. If you cleave the protein in the wrong place, you end up with hydrophobic in-groups, and these will provide bitter notes that you notice. So choosing the right protein that knows which amino acids to cleave the protein between is a way to improve uh, those bitter notes that you'd otherwise see. I asked for inside baseball. You gave it to us. Thank you. So, <laughs> that was geeky. So I liked just to, it. Just to add on, uh, I think he hit a, one of the key parts. I think there's a lot of uh, research from a flavor, like because literally the flavor research side that universities are spending time on really creating PhDs and master's students, I would say in the last 30 to 40 years has, has been much more tremendous, focused on flavors, right? So when you look at the research that is out there, this was done by Schieberle's and some of, some of the work. This is all done using what is called a GCO, gas chromatography olfactorimetry. The reason being, at the end of the day, your nose is the best detector out there, right? Even the, even the best GC and the out there will not be comparable to your nose. But at the same time, nose is good enough to peel it, while a gas chromatography is pulling each one separate and you know each compound in it, the nose can do it in an extraordinary fashion, right? So what we know today on this flavor volatile side is just that these compounds are present. And these compounds are either caused by lipid oxidation, they are caused by myelite chemistry, they're caused by aspects of you know, myelite chemistry with the comp like, and lipid products further on higher temperature forming other compounds. So that part is sort of clear. I still feel myelite chemistry is not completely understood. This is a good term to mask when we don't want to talk anything about <laughs> thing. I personally think there is a need for myelite chemistry to be understood at a higher level. The beauty is in the previous session, the use of artificial intelligence is a great place there untargeted analysis where we can link all these compounds, proteins, peptides, and really understanding is very critical. That's on the volatile space. The only one addition I'll add is also there is a need for um, non-volatiles, peptides. Mm -hmm. As, I mean, peptide work is done in therapeutics. We know that there's a lot of biological systems where people look into type of peptides. Food industry, for some reason, we don't spend much time about the good peptides and the bad peptides. P by itself was not bad. But as you're processing, as, as just mentioned, it cuts it at a wrong place. Then you are starting to get bitter. And then you're figuring out what masker should I add to block it. Why don't we first understand this? And there is a chance for all of the community, especially in the scientific side, to actually have like an open research platform where everybody can share the peptides. Hey, I made this way. Here are all the peptides. Because with time, the more information is out there, the more we know what we are going after. OK, you can say that part of it is, is a IP. But to some extent, if we are in this together, I think there are some knowledge-based generation that we need to be happening together to solve the taste problem. I, I totally agree. The, the easiest way to deal with an off flavor is not produce it in the first place. Yeah. And, and that's really where this process question comes out. And I mm -hmm. think when we go back to the scale issue, mm -hmm. it's not like you can jump from your legacy business to 
having a really um, customized ecosystem just for plant-based proteins. So how do you see the business opportunity, the business pressure to move towards more plant-based protein and how that's sort of bridged by steps? Sure. So part of our vision has been, you know, if we eventually want to feed X amount of the, of the population plant-based proteins, you know, it is a series of steps. And one way to deal with it that, that helps on the flavor side is basically hybrid products. So if you think about, uh, I've worked a, a long time, or rather my team has, in making soy as bland as possible. I have trouble making it taste like dairy milk. But if you blend dairy milk with soy milk, you end up with something that tastes a lot closer to dairy milk. And so these hybrid products that, that basically make animal proteins more sustainable by extending them with plant proteins can be some of these intermediate steps along the way. I want to talk about sofritas. Sofritas are my favorite product at Chipotle. Thank you. Thank you. I have no idea what it is. Uh, it, I tasted it once. I liked it. I go back for the sofritas. Mm -hmm. How much do we need to replicate existing meat products? Or do you think the consumer is ready for protein? Or uh, just a thing that has a weird name that you don't need to define? Rajesh, have you seen in the work that you've done that Consumers are open to that? Um, I, we see that, uh, I mean, you could take it in two ways, right? For, in the nutrition beverage categories or in the beverage categories, I think you do see this mixing of protein. Even when you don't need protein, you tend to see there is now 20 grams of protein. I'm adding you, right? That's kind of approach. In, when it comes to meat, I think there are two aspects. The target is mainly flexitarians. In the short term, again, this is my personal opinion, not to do with uh, anything to do with Kerry, but is in the small, in the short term, for a marketing purposes, focusing on a flexitarian and calling it meat may be good. But in the same time, I also feel in the long run, in terms of policy making, in terms of setting up the ground rules, I think it can create some hurdles uh, for, for it being called meat. Um, and at the, at the same time, I mean, again, I, I go back to where I come from and my roots. I mean, if you take the integration of culinary techniques and the cultures, like, like I mean, the cultures of India, China, or, or, or even in Latin areas, there are products that they sell, and none of them are called uh, protein, right? But they, they, are, they are making these, these beautiful products um, in, in, in their countries. So it's almost like, getting exposed to them, and then ability to slowly, it, it, will, it will take time, behaviors take time. Um, so in that sense, um, my thought is there is still a um, chance for providing options. Like Morningstar doesn't call everything a meat alternative. I mean, they have been there for a long time. I mean, that's a great example of, uh, of saying that you don't need to call sometimes meat alternative and still can penetrate into the market. I'll just add with my mom hat on. I really resonated with one of the previous panelists talked about um, designing products for the occasion. And that 5.30 to 8 o'clock thing is an occasion that is a difficult occasion at times. Um, and I feel that when you have, there's so much conversation about comparing plant-based plant meat, for instance, to you know, animal meat and how it's different. But as I'm feeding my kids, both, um, they're not necessarily, they're being raised to have a palate around plant-based meat, where I don't think you're always going to have to have that same um, pressure of having to replicate animal, animal products the same way. They can have their own flavor profiles. Um, I think it's interesting to, again, look at the, the trajectory of the product. And Mark, if you were um, working with Natalie, what would be something you would ask of her to change in the products that you take raw and process? What's something that would make your life easier to ultimately create a better product? So um, she mentioned a couple of them already. One is uh, it, you know, improving amino acid profiles. Uh, one of the things that, that makes soy such an important plant protein is it has a PDCAS score. That is the protein digestibility amino acid score. And that, that's very near the same as dairy or egg or meat. Um, 
If you look at a wheat protein, uh, in comparison, it's only about 0.5. Uh, many other proteins are just not nearly as good as soy happens to be. Now, one thing you can do is you can blend certain proteins. So you could blend wheat with you know, a legume and end up with something that's going to be closer to the one. But the amino acid profile would be one. Uh, the other thing would be dealing with some of the, um, the off-flavored precursors. So for example, um, <clears throat> a, a crop that's high in linoleic acid, which is uh, readily oxidizable and creates some off flavors or linoleic acid, if you make that a higher oleic, then these, a lot of these issues go away. So those would be, it'd be compositional changes that would improve the flavor, would improve the nutrition. And j just to add on uh, his comment, the PDCAS, because the Kerry being a taste and nutrition company, we have offerings with where the PDCAS is one. But while the nutrition team is very clear that these are the type of proteins you blend to provide this, this complete source, it also creates taste challenges. Like earlier I was mentioning about the GCO techniques. These techniques were done to find each ingredient, each chemical. But the problem is when you're mixing these blends, now you're creating another off note. You do, and it, it, it is not made up. Like I, we have done some studies where we actually are finding that the compounds, that one compound that is formed by linoleic acid in one protein and the linoleic acid by another protein, these are degradation products. When they both are together, our brain interprets it differently. So just imagine the flavor complexity. It is not singularly knowing that just adding ethyl butyrate will give me a nice estuary note. To, now you're talking about compounds like, uh, like hexanals and uh, non-enals um, and a pentyl furans. So these compounds, they, together, each one together, there is a need for more studies to understand how two compounds are, are working together and how that makes our brain think there is more off note there than actually it is. So that means those synergies are not well understood. Mm -hmm. And that, are, that is another thing that needs to be taken into account. Yeah. So if you could affect process, transport, supply sourcing, and work with Mark to improve your, what you do, what would be some specific requests you would make on that side, going directly to the process part? So the process part, I, I think it is that uh, common understanding of, uh, without not getting into the details of their IP, what are the steps where, like, are you keeping at a certain temperature for long? Like, uh, just to give an analogy, right? If you take chicken, and the chicken, if you're putting it in a, bo like boiling it or making a broth, versus you're roasting, you know they are not fit, forming different compounds, right? In one case, you have more lipid oxidized. In the other case, you have more myelite products, right? Just taking the same approach and back off, because at the end of the day, the, the same proteins have the same lipid problem, same, same uh, protein amino acids that are coming into play, and thus reducing sugars that are present in the product. Mm -hmm. um, so, just understanding that science, right? Mm -hmm. And the ability to integrate all three factors. I still go back to sensory, because I, at the end of the day, defining the problem when working mm -hmm. together with mm -hmm. the ingredient scientists, very, what are your process parameters? Which pro process parameters may be where the, this flavor generation is happening? Mm -hmm. um, then linking it with the, the sensory to really correlate, or to understand, is that our main problem, or is it at a different stage of the process? And sometimes you can solve it there itself. Or sometimes because of the supply chain issues, Rajesh, we can't, we, this is already investment made. Then in those cases, you have to go and solve it from back. And this is where one of the comments that Scott May made was, was relevant. Like you need to then find blockers mm -hmm. that will actually not bind your flavor that you are going to add and still be effectively able to help you. Yeah. Uh, that's the last option, but it would be better we could do it in the front. And in many cases, there's quite a bit of research that's been done on some of these metabolic pathways and um, and when we have all this data and the computational capabilities that we have today, we're really able to identify, you know, what are the genes that need to be addressed or what kind of predictive breeding needs to be done much faster than we could before. I want to take some audience questions because we've really dug into the process from the, the, the lab to the field to the processing to the transport to the recipe and we've gone all the way through this and really looked at sort of some of the legacy issues and how building a more streamlined ecosystem can really help with the end product. Um, so I feel like we've really touched on a lot of those things. And I want to get to some of these questions from the audience. This one's from Travis. He says, I found that alternative cheeses 
Apologies to Daya seem to be lagging behind alternative meats. Is there a food chemistry barrier to recreating cheese? Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. Mark or Rajesh? Which one of you? I'm, I, I'm, like I'll follow his so, so the unique thing about the dairy proteins, the caseins in cheese, they have uh, disulfide linkages, and uh, they're very difficult to reproduce with the uh, plant proteins. Probably wheat protein comes the closest, but that's what gives it that stretch. And it's very difficult to get that, that rheology uh, from most plant proteins that the cheeses have. So that is a challenge that we're looking to, to solve and it's, uh, it, it may take some, some uh, special tools in, in altering those proteins, changing some of the amino acids to get that functionality. Uh, the add-on would be uh, more on the, the release characteristics. Here we are not talking about the compounds because I think the flavor compounds that need, like you could always come up with a natural vegan flavor that is dairy, like has the same compounds that, that can be made. But when you add it again into a matrices, when they are releasing, because what happens is something like cheese, the, it's, it's a balance of the mouthfeel aspect, the umami, the salts, and as it is coming, some of these, uh, these lactones and the, and the butyric acid, it's very low levels, like all of these are helping you get that whole experience. So when you're mimicking like something like cheese, you need not just the right things put in the box, but also releasing at the same time. Why? Because what happens is something may release too fast, and then the rest is looking like just a powder in your mouth. Or what happens is sometimes something doesn't release, and as you finish chewing, then it starts to hit in the back of the mouth, and I'm like, oh God, why did I eat this, right? <laughs> so I'm sure we had both scenarios. So I think that release characteristics becomes very important. I, this question is interesting because it's a pretty tough one for you guys to answer because it goes into your core business, but is it more advisable for companies to scale up their own protein source as to, opposed to buying commercial sources? And I think I might ask that question of you, Natalie, because you're really talking about doing research in a, a deep dive in a way that might be hard from an R&D budget for a startup company. Yeah. So um, one of the things that is important as we talk about evolving our food system, we're going to make some really big system changes in the whole value chain in order to do that. So one of the things we're, we're trying to do here is build out essentially an R&D platform um, where if a company is vertically integrated for a certain crop, we can work with their scientists and give them the tools they need. But if a company isn't doing anything with genomics, is just sourcing ingredients, there's different ways that we have partnership models where we can essentially develop the kind of crop they want and even the supply chain that they're looking for. So we have essentially um, ourselves evolved to understand as we're trying to work with companies that have different kinds of capacity around using genomics as a lever, how do we make ourselves really bring them value? And, and so we've, de we've, de we've developed these different partnership models to do that. And sometimes it makes sense for them to do it, uh, source it themselves directly and to really own that entire supply chain. And sometimes it makes more sense for them to be sourcing it different ways. The trick here is, and this is why I love it with your theme that you've brought to this panel, is it's really about a lot of collaboration. We need to have much more collaborative approaches to understand each other's pain points and design the ingredients for the, the final product you want and do this as efficiently as possible. And that's why this business model I tried to highlight, which is not just Benson Hill, there's a lot of different companies bringing a different mindset of business innovation that I think is much more collaborative than what we've seen before. If I were writing a story um, or doing a piece about what we've been talking about today and trying to get to the central nut of the problem, it does seem like it's an issue of IP versus open source. You know, both of you have mentioned the benefit of sharing information and for you knowing where the product has been, what its trajectory and processing has experienced, sort of um, some sort of a, a, a timeline for it, you know, but that's a lot of the IP that you mm -hmm. make your, your business on. So I can see the dilemma. Is there going to be a shift here? Does there have to be to solve this problem? Actually, it is happening as we talk, I guess, the, the acquisition of wild flavors by ADM is a good example. The, the acquisition of some of the flavor companies by Kerry, because Kerry started off as a dairy uh, corporate, and with time, this bought companies that are 
that are more in the yeast space. Then they have natural preservatives, smoke. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you look at all the type of companies that were purchased, even, even if you look at Jivadan buying out Spice Tech, all these are examples of like slowly, like the ingredient and the flavor companies having to work together. Absolutely. One way is mergers, the other way is through partnerships. Mm -hmm. I think mergers seems to be a faster short term, so they jump and maybe they have money more. So have possible versus the partnerships is literally we are bringing the lawyers into the game. So then it's like, okay, when are they coming done? This is a JDA, so we can start talking about science. So that delays the process, but whoever is able to persist that actually are able to do good work. Mark, I want to let you talk about this too, and and I want to fold in kind of the last concept here, which is what's the call to action for this audience and our live stream audience? You know, we're talking about industry folks, scientists, journalists, communicators with the, the, the consumer. What's the call to action for them as we've kind of identified the problem and what's in progress to solve it? You know, one of the most exciting things I think about the whole clean meat movement is how science is actually being embraced by the clean meat movement. Uh, we've had uh, in our consumers kind of this focus towards, uh, you know, I want the, uh, the least process, least science, you know, that sort of thing. But yet a lot, science can bring a lot from a nutrition standpoint. Uh, you know, one of the great things about plant proteins is not that it's just a source of protein, it's also a source of fiber. We're really beginning to learn how Fiber acts as a prebiotic with our gut microbiome. One of our most recent investments is in the area of probiotics and understanding the gut microbiome and, and that gut-brain axis. And so I think the key thing is to get consumers to realize that science can be used as a tool in a good way to improve nutrition, to, um, you know, to pre in preventative medicine. Uh, Dean Ornish, I know one of the things that he has focused on down through the years has been the incorporation of higher levels of fiber into the diet, and plant proteins inherently can carry those proteins into the diet or that fiber into the diet as well. So I think it, at the end of the day, it's this understanding that we can use these uh, new uh, genetic editing tools, these things to actually improve health to improve sustainability. And I, I think that's part of the message and part of the call to action is just educating the people around you that you know science is a tool, you can use it for good, you can use it for bad, but the focus here is improving nutrition, improving sustainability, and improving taste, convenience, everything. Embracing science, sharing information to streamline the process all the way through the ecosystem chain, and communicating with the end consumer. I think that's what we walk away from this panel with. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Natalie uh, De De Nicola from Benson Hill Biosystems, uh, Mark Matlock from ADM, thank you, and Rajesh, you have been amazing, Potanini from uh, Kerry, really appreciate the contribution all of you have made. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you.